how would you address that with someone that mentioned that to you? Just saying that, oh, well, all of these are similar. They have the same purpose, the same function or very, very similar functions because of a common ancestor. How would you approach that with them? I would say that's your interpretive framework. That's where you're going to be with your with your mechanism is that you're going to claim a common ancestor. And, you know, the, I, I mentioned that it was the genetics that was very similar right at the very beginning, the same same genes, they're called Hox genes, which are very, very similar that set development down a particular path. But they're also very, very different. Hello, everyone. Welcome to The Creation Podcast, the show where we discuss the science that confirms scripture. I'm your host, Lauren, and I have with me today ICR President, Dr. Randy Galuza. Thanks for being with us today. No, thank you very much for the invitation. It's always good having you here. And today we're talking about something that everybody thinks about every day, but often without realizing that they're thinking about it because they just use it so often, it's so commonplace. We are going to talk about eyes, particularly human eyes. We'll focus in on that. And eyes are incredibly complex. We see them in other people that we're talking with. We make eye contact. We think about it all the time because we're seeing things. And yet we very rarely, most of us very rarely think about how they actually function. So we're going to jump into that a little bit today. So let's just kind of jump right into the basics. How does the eye work? Well, this is only a short podcast, and so we really can't get into all those details on the eye, but we really need to talk more about just the eye. We need to talk about the visual system, and the system has multiple parts to it, any one of which, in this particular case, if it was gone, you would go blind, and then you wouldn't be able to see. So the main purpose of your eye is to gather data. The eyeball itself is a data gatherer. And then the rest of the visual system, from the eye going backwards, processes the data. And in fact, the back of your eye, the retina, is really an extension of your brain. And data already begins processed right in the back of your eye until it's processed in your brain. And it makes associations with things that you have learned, your memories. And then you're able to visualize something in your brain. Not in your eye, but in your brain. And the support structures around it, and I know you're going to want to talk about these today, uh, keep that eye functioning. Support structures like your eyelids, the muscles, tears, and all of those things. So taken together, starting from the outside, lids, tears, eyeballs, uh, optic nerves, brain, visual cortex, the whole shebang is all part of an entire visual system, which hopefully will gather data and that you will turn it into useful information. That's the goal. Okay, that's a great overview. So that's what we're going to talk about today. And before we jump into the specific details, some of which you already mentioned, what's the gist of how our eyes and our brain work together to produce what we call sight? Well, as I mentioned, eyes eyes gather data. Eyes, um, they, t- they really just collect photons. And photons are tiny little packets of light energy and nobody knows exactly what they are. We just know that they exist and that you can quantify them and nobody knows exactly exactly what light itself is and has characteristics of waves, has characteristics of particles, but it's it goes in and you have little sensors and I'll talk about those in a second that can detect those and those send, that's actually sent as data to the back of your eye. And then it is processed, and it's actually processed in conjunction with other input. In fact, you don't even have to have data from your eyes in order to see things. So I could ask you, hey, Lauren, hey, close your eyes. And then you would close your eyes, and I would say, and everybody watching the podcast right now can close their eyes. So if you close your eyes, and I were to say, just say some words to you. A, what's up, Doc? Everybody sees... Bugs Bugs Bunny. Bunny. They see Bugs Bunny, and and they usually get a big smile on their face. Then I even ask them, well, what's Bugs got in his hand? Carrot. Carrot. Naturally. That's right. So you don't even, nobody's looking at Bugs Bunny right now, but just saying the words uh, brings back an association with something that you've learned, that you've actually seen. Your brain has made these connections, and so you can actually see it. You visualize it in your mind and in your brain without even having input from your eyes. 
you can do the same thing. I, I could ring, I could shake a set of keys and you would know it. I could open a door, it could squeak, that's a squeaky door. So you can do all of these kinds of things. I could put a smell in your nose and you would visualize, ah, Thanksgiving sweet potatoes or mashed potatoes and all these things and you would see those things. And it works vice versa. You can see something and you can recall an aroma, things like that. That's because your brain's wired together with the areas that associate. And they used to think they were totally distinct areas, but now we know they're not completely distinct. A visual area, not totally con- distinct from, a, from an o- o- olfactory area where you would smell things and the like. When you're beginning to grow up, uh, your mom and your dad, a lot of times your mom, um, kids want to know what something is. And then mom will tell them, oh, this is a water bottle. This is water. This is things. So you take the visual data that you're getting, and all the time you're growing up, you're putting together a pattern, as best we can understand, somewhere in there, and then you associate that pattern with water. And then from then on, the rest of your life, as you see that pattern, and the pattern is, is processed incredibly fast in your brain, you will associate that with water. And that's how you see stuff. So does that start, does that process of starting to create connections in your brain, does that start super, super early? Like when someone's just a baby, practically just born, is their brain, as soon as they kind of come out, is their brain already starting to form those connections? Or does it start a little later in childhood? Do we know anything about that? It actually starts while you're still in the womb. Wow. Those connections are beginning to start and patterning and stuff is is beginning to process there. And babies are already... Um, when they're born, they seem to be able to recognize stuff intuitively right from the very beginning on that. Um, nobody knows exactly what newborn visual acuity really is because you can't do an eye test on them. Uh, estimates I've seen anywhere from 2,100 to 2,600. So not really, really sh- super cr- sharp, crisp visual acuity like you and I would have, but it's there and it's enough to recognize things uh, initially, uh, but th- almost uh, immediately they start to make the associations. And that's why it's so important that babies are born with functioning eyes. Not only are they making those associations right from a very early age, but they're actually developing their pathways, their optic pathways, neural pathways. And if, though, if you're not getting input from one of your eyes, then that pathway will not develop normally. Mm-hmm. So you ask a very good question. Uh, sometimes babies are, are born with what it was generally called a lazy eye. That means one eye is usually turned in or turned out. The muscles are not quite in perfect alignment. And the treatment for that until you corrective surgery can be done is to do eye patching. So you will patch both eyes, not just the one that's turned out. You'll patch the, the eye that you would normally be looking at. That'll force the eye that's turned out to look at me making the other eye turn out Mm. but it's under the patch Mm -hmm. so it's not getting input right and then after you're not training it to do that it's just right so you're not training it but you're what you're doing is forcing both eyes to take in data Mm -hmm. and then that pathway the neurological pathway will develop normally if you don't patch then the eye that's turned out will become what's called amblyopic it'll become blind even though the eyeball itself is perfectly normal Mm -hmm. it's blind because the pathway did not develop Normally, So when you patch, you force both eyes to work, forcing both visual pathways to develop normally. Okay, that makes sense. I always, I've known a couple people that had lazy eyes and I just always assumed it was directly to do with their eye, but it sounds like it's way beyond that in the brain. Very intricate. So let's go down into some of the specific pieces that make up our eyes. We'll start from the outside and kind of work our way in just with the parts that we're more familiar with just because we see them a lot. So let's talk about eyelashes, eyelids, kind of the stuff on the outside, and we'll just kind of work our way in a little bit. Eyelashes, eyelids, particularly the lids, are absolutely essential for sight. Obviously, you, if you don't have them, your eye will dry out and you'll go blind for that. And the structure of the eyelid itself is, is quite remarkable inside. Uh, it's got a lot of detail. It has tiny little muscles in it for one thing. So when, when I roll my eyes up, you'll see they fold up. I'm looking at yours. There's very, very thin muscles right inside the lid itself. 
which help that eyelid retract. You have muscles above it that help it retract, but there's muscles in the lid itself which do that. But your lid also has a structure to it. And there's a piece of dense connective tissue. It's not cartilage. It's a, it's a different type of tissue that gives your lid its, its shape. And you can actually, you don't sense it or you don't feel it, but normally it's on, on the playground. And it's early on, little boys chase around girls and they pull their eyelids out and they flip them up and they hold them in this upright flipped position. And that normally when I'm doing this talk, I, I say that's like an early mating ritual that they have <laughs> right there. It is. I think it's obligatory for all boys in elementary school. <laughs> right, to do something like that. Yeah. Well, the reason why they, they can stay up like that is because that dense connective tissue is in there and they're not, they're not just, you know, totally soft and, and flaccid. They have this rigidity to them. And that connective tissue gives your eyelid its shape. But built inside even the connective tissue itself are tiny little glands called my mybomian glands. My bo- mybomian. Mybomian. Mybomian glands. glands. Okay. And they produce oils. And the oils are excreted through tiny little pores right on your lid margins. Um, and you can actually see them if you look really close and you're, and you're young enough and you have very good near vision. You can see tiny little droplets of oil forming on them, and then they swipe onto the eye. It does two things. One, it lubricates, so when you blink, you know, once every second or two. Uh, without that lubrication, your, your blinking would erode away your cornea and you'd go blind. That's a problem. That's a problem. Uh, they also put a little oily layer of film over your watery tears so that the watery tears don't evaporate away so quickly. So like almost everything in your body multiple functions for one thing. And so those those are absolutely essential. High I've level had, of efficiency. Exactly. High level of efficiency. And I've had patients who were in a car accident too, in fact, and their eyelid was uh, partially detached. And it's an emergency. You have to cover that eye, get that lid back on, and um, provide some protective cover for it. Uh, you can make a type of artificial eyelid from tissue from the inside of your mouth and the back of your ear if, you're, if you lost your eyelid. It doesn't function anything like the, the real deal, but you need something to keep that eye covered. Okay, so we talked about the eyelid. What role do the eyelashes play in any of that? Well, eyelashes are kind of a protective feature and a sensory feature. Eyelashes obviously keep debris uh, from inside your eye. But in my opinion... The main function they do is they, they enable you to detect uh, things that are coming close that could damage your eye. Just tapping an eye lash will cause you to uh, blink, close your eyes. And those. So they're, they're almost like little feelers or sensors um, to force you to take cover when something could uh, damage your eye. It's almost why, like, as women, when we're putting on mascara, we almost have to contort our faces into all these funny positions because we're trying to keep our eyes open because our eyes want to close because we're touching the eyelashes. And Yeah. Yeah. So okay. You're trying to override those natural reflexes. Mm -hmm. Are they hooked up to nerves or how do they? Yes. Okay. Yeah, almost everything's hooked up to nerves <laughs> uh, on that. And otherwise, you wouldn't be able to detect it. So the nerves will carry that, that motion and vibration back right through the lid and cause you to have this grimacing reflex that you're talking about. Okay. So what about the part of the eyes? We love seeing pictures of just these beautiful eyes with the iris and the pupil and all of that. And it's just, it's beautiful. Let's talk a little bit about just that part that we can see. Right. Well, it is beautiful. Uh, the, what the Lord creates is not only functional, but he makes it, um, he makes it beautiful and it's beautiful in his own way. Uh, but eyes are almost universally recognized to be uh, beautiful uh, that particularly when you can get enough of the lid raised so that you can actually uh, see those eyes. In fact, I can tell you that was one of the first things that attracted me to June when we were in high school was her big eyes. And that It was like, oh, those look really, really good. She's a lovely woman for those of you who aren't privileged to know her. <laughs> yes, she is. She is on that. So the eyes are beautiful. And what you're, you're, you're not just looking at the color of the eye. The cornea itself, the way it reflects light and sparkles on light um, is itself a beautiful feature to it. And the cornea is the clear part of your eye that bulges out from that. And the iris is the colored part behind it. So together with the cornea, the iris, and then the, uh, the aperture, the little opening in the iris, which is your pupil, um, it gives you that feature. And human eyes are, have sclera that are not 
generally pigmented, so they have that white feature around it. Mm -hmm. In contrast to your skin tones, they outline um, a really lovely feature. And then sometimes you can augment them with whatever you put on your eyes. (laughs) Yes. And what about what about our pupils? Because I know my cat, I look at my cat and sometimes when it's dark, his pupils are just massive. And obviously we can see it on a smaller scale with human eyes as well, which is like obviously our topic today. But can you talk a little bit about pupils and how they, you, you, talk, you called it the aperture. That's more a photography term. How does that work? Well, when you're looking at an eye, you'll see the little black spot. Actually, that's there's there's no pigment there. You're just looking straight into the eye. You're looking all the way straight to the back of the eye. And the iris, uh, the, the color part of your eye, has two types of muscles in it. You have um, constrictors, which is a sphincter muscle, which will cause that pupil to shrink down tight. And then you have dilators, and they're, they're running perpendicular to that they're running actually from the pupil out towards the end of where the iris is attached on that eye. And they'll, they'll dilate the eye in dark conditions, and there's a feedback mechanism from, from what you're seeing. So when it's dark, the dilators will, will pull that aperture wide open. You can put medications into it as well. That can cause it to open when a doctor wants to look at the back of your eyes all the way out to the periphery to see if you have any tears or holes or anything like that. In bright sunlight, you have the exact opposite effect. The, uh, the constrictors will pull that iris down almost to a pinpoint um, type of aperture, very, very small. Uh, certain drugs cause it to come, become constricted as well. In certain brain conditions, um, you can diagnose just by looking at the pupil. Um, one constricted or normal, one dilated or vice versa. You can tell whether there's a lesion in the brain, or things like that, because of of the way the feedback mechanism works. Right. Well, and just th- just like we talked about earlier, there's a very close connection between the mind and the eye. It's it's they have to work very much in tandem. So that, and the brain. That makes sense. And, and the brain. brain. Yeah. And all works in close uh, very, very closely. So what they do is they rapidly regulate the uh, amount and the brightness of the light getting into your eyes. Uh, your cat will have another, generally, will have another layer of tissue in the back, which allows them to reflect and reflect not in a random way, but to reflect in a highly coordinated way so that the, the light comes in, it gets reflected back, and it, can, it, it allows a greater opportunity to detect what little photons of light there are in a dark condition better. Uh, cats have it. You obviously, deer, when, you, when your headlights hit the deer and it's looking at you, you'll see this bright reflection back. Humans don't have that, uh, but certain animals have those things which enable them to see better in dark conditions. Okay, so moving inward even more, what happens once the photons enter and that input that we see enters into our eyes? What happens then? Well, it has to be processed. And it has, first of all, it has to be focused. It has to be focused on a visual area in the back of your eye. And the, the main focuser of light is not your lens. Everybody talks about their lens. It's really your cornea. Um, and that's the clear tissue uh, on the outside of the eye. That is the, that is the first thing that's going to focus. So when someone has refractive surgery like LASIK, they're able to just modify the cornea a little bit, and that will change the focus. So they can go from either a nearsighted or farsighted state, hopefully to something which is normal on that. So you do that by adjusting the cornea there. So the cornea is crystal clear. It's made out of the same, almost the same tissue that the white part of your eye is made out of. But there are a layer of cells right behind the cornea which pump out um, sodium molecules. And when a sodium molecule is pumped out, a water molecule will follow it. So your cornea stays crystal clear primarily because it's in a dehydrated state. And and all the water is pumped out when those cells are damaged the fluid and the water will build up in your eye and you get a cloudy cornea. Mm. And you've seen people with cloudy cornea Mm -hmm. there. So um, fortunately, you can get a cornea transplant if that is permanently damaged and they usually work. And then light will flow through the cornea. It goes through a little layer of water called aqueous, right, right behind the cornea, through the pupil, and then it'll have its final focus by the next tissue it'll hit, which is your lens. And your lens... 
um, enables, enables you primarily to see things up close. It'll, it'll bulge out when things are close and allows you to give near vision. As you get older, two things happen to your lens. One, it gets uh, stiff, so it doesn't flex nearly as much. And two, it becomes a little cloudy. You, ultraviolet light, particularly with people who are outside a lot, tends to damage that, and you'll get a, and you'll get a cataract in your eye, which will then block the light coming through. When you're young, you can take your hand and you can hold it like this far away and you can get a really good focus on it and you can rapidly move it up and you can stay, things will stay in focus. As you get older like me, uh, it doesn't flex as much and you have to use bifocals to, to get that close vision on there. So your lens is, is primarily giving you really, really close, fine vision, but it'll, it'll, get, it'll change state so that you can focus on things further away. Once the light passes through that, hopefully it'll focus on a very fine point in a place called your fovea. And the fovea is where you have, where most of your vision is taking place. Some of it happens in the periphery, but the vast majority of it is happening on the fovea. So in other words, if I'm looking at you right now, we're making eye contact, my, it's, your eyes are the fovea? Is I, that? What you, well, my, the light that is reflecting off me from these lights and back into your eye is being focused on a tiny little part of your retina called the fovea. It's, it's, a, it's a, about the diameter of a, a pencil lead from an old-time pencil. That's about how big it is in the back. And you have two types of photo sensors in the back of your eye, rods and cones. Rods enable you to see in better in dark conditions. They're able to see gross, large movements and things like that. And they're, they're scattered around the periphery. At, and you have cones, which enable you to see color vision, reds, blues, and greens. At the fovea that I'm talking about, you only have cones. Okay. And they enable you to see the colors, but also very, very sharp, fine vision. So it makes sense that at that back part of your eye where you're focusing, you'd only have these cones. And that's what we have in, in your fovea here. And it's kept alive by blood flow to the back of your eye, but it doesn't, blood doesn't flow over the fovea. It just flows up to the fovea so that light isn't, in any way hindered by from, the blood by the blood and that's why you don't have blood circulating <laughs> around on your cornea either the fluid that i mentioned behind it nourishes that cornea and um, and then the oxygen that it can get from the outside so where you have to have clear vision you don't have blood vessels it's an incredible design feature there because after all you're wanting information and blood vessels on your cornea on your lens over your fovea those kinds of things would ruin that. So once light hits that back of your eye that we're talking about, what happens then? Well, it triggers a reaction. And it's really a very complicated chemical reaction that I, I don't have time to go through here. But it's, it's very similar in almost all creatures, by the way, that this chemical reaction takes place. A, a single photon of light will change the shape of one molecule and it's, it's bent in a way that it stores energy and it's attached to another molecule called an opsin molecule. And when a single photon of light hits it, that molecule will change shape, go from a bent shape to a straight shape, detach. It will activate that opsin molecule, which goes through a long cascade to amplify the signal many times over, which then eventually results in a slight electrical discharge from one of these photosensors, and it sends about 40 millivolts of electricity back down the optic nerve to the back of your eye. And you're literally sending hundreds of millions of these, much less than a second. And you're, so your brain is processing loads of bits of data, and every one of those little discharges of electricity is a little bit of data, boom, 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 going back to your eye. Well, it's incredible how quickly this happens because even as you move your hand like that, my eyes are able to track your hand movement and I see it in real time. Whereas right. even a lot of cameras that we use, they're getting pretty close to right on time, but even there's some amount of delay, even with the most highly developed cameras, there's some amount of delay. And just the fact that our eyes and our brains are able to, to adjust to that, to develop those images so rapidly, it's just astounding. And that many, 
like the world's biggest computer might get overwhelmed by oh it would how be many, yeah the world's biggest computer would would be overwhelmed a uh, world's biggest computer cannot process what your brain is processing uh, right now it would take it, it, I, when I, sh- I, I shouldn't say it couldn't process it it couldn't process it at the speeds that we're processing at it right now it would it would take a long time for it to process. You see the, the data. little spinning circle of death, like we used to see on the computers. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So your brain is processing incredible amounts of of data, and in order also to see and to keep your eyes in motion and things like this, it's processing data not just from your eyes. It's processing data from your ears, and so when I track a baseball coming for me, and I I can move my eyes, and I can move my head like this, but my eyes stay completely focused on you with that or I can do this I can I can keep them locked on and scanning so I can scan or I can track something like that just the the computing power for that alone is phenomenal uh, we, we now put it into weapon systems where you have a tank which can be going over bumpy terrain or moving but it can keep its barrel tracking a target mm-hmm. while the rest of the tank is turning and moving and you have to have incredible computers processing just that one thing and your brain does it all the time with movements and everything it's 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 quite remarkable it's incredible it's mind-blowing actually so that brings up a crucial question because we're talking about complicated processes we're talking about basically machinery that is just getting all those signals back up to your brain from your eyes every single step of the way there's all these little tiny pieces working just right we're talking about the brain taking in um, information from multiple sources, like you mentioned your ears, I'm assuming you're talking about with balance, where your brain and your eyes and your ears and all of this are working together to know where you are in space and where your eyes need to be in space and all of that. This is complicated stuff. And yet a lot of people today claim that it just happened. What do you think about that? Well, that's a very, very poor explanation for the design that we are clearly seeing out there. Um, they have to say that because when you see something operating for a purpose, like your visual system is, you the question on hand is, how did it get here? Because you see things when you see things operating for a purpose, you naturally infer that there was um, a cause of that. And particularly for very, very complicated things, you infer that there was an agent behind it, a designing agent who put something, who has foresight and can put something together on purpose. So in biology, one of your main questions are, are, you know, is there an agent behind this? Or is nature sufficient unto itself to explain it without recourse to an agent? And that's the, those are some of the big, big questions. Evolutionists um, try to overcome that by, one, claiming that the purpose that we see was really just an evolved purpose. So the fancy word we use for purpose is teleology, where we say, oh, there's, this is, that's from a Greek meaning purposeful. And they've invented a new word, teleonomy, meaning, oh, there's a purpose, and we see the purpose, but it's not a purpose that originated from a thoughtful thinking agent, it's a purpose that has evolved slowly over a long, long period of time. Therefore, it's not really teleology, it's teleonomy. It's an evolved purpose. And this is really just kind of a game. It is. It's a word game. It's, it's, a, it's a word game. It's, they can't deny purpose. They can't deny, oh, your heart, it pumps blood for a purpose. They can't deny, oh, your kidneys, they filter blood for a purpose. Your eyes, they collect this data for a purpose. You know, that would almost uh, be totally irrational to say there's no purpose behind all of these things. So they play this word game and that evolved for a purpose. Therefore, it's not teleology, it's teleonomy in there. But they they have no evidence uh, at all that this visual system evolved. In fact, their story keeps changing. Uh, When I was first studying creation and evolution years ago, the claim was that uh, visual systems evolved at least 40 times throughout the history of life because they were very, very different. You know, you have the, you have the eyes of a, of a dragonfly, which are very different than our eye. And, and so you have all these different types of eyes. So you have to come up with this 
concocted story that everything evolved independently from scratch at least 40 different times. And then I've heard some estimates that said it was 60 different times because you start to find all these differences. And then they found that the genetics behind eyes was something that they never predicted. It was very similar. So if you look at the eye of that dragonfly and you look at the genetics as it develops from an egg and you look at us as we develop from a, a fertilized egg, you'll find that they have essentially the same genes controlling it during development. It's a gene called the Pax 6 gene, and it's ubiquitous. We find it in all kinds of creatures. And nobody ever predicted that from an evolutionary standpoint. It was totally astounding when they found this. Because you think, oh, these eyes are so different. They, they certainly look different. They're certainly different. They had to evolve independently over this time. And then they came up with a concocted story. Well, that gene was so important that if it would have mutated, then the loss of vision would have been so bad that these organisms wouldn't have survived. Therefore, that gene has been conserved over, over hundreds of millions of years while the rest of the gene, genome is mutating away, causing all these differences between a dragonfly and me. This one gene, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't change. It's been conserved. So you play these vocabulary games. Now you have and conservation. Numbers games, and they're numbers, because they're not paying attention to the odds. If you really, truly look at the odds of something evolving the same way or in a similar purpose 40 different times, if you look at the odds of that, they're astronomical. That's impossible. Yeah, they w- the odds would be incredibly low. There's all the things that we discussed about the human eye that I talked about at the beginning of this podcast, we're just scratching the surface. Uh, the, the the complexity goes far, far above anything that I was talking about earlier. So we're just scratching the surface. It's impressive enough what I was talking about, but in order to really explain this, as you're talk, as you're saying, the probability of getting these things is an infinitesimally small. So how do they overcome incre- incredibly small probabilities? They come up with a, an agent of their own. And they come up with an agent of their own. That's right. Perfect. You've been, you've been listening to our <laughs> podcasts on these things. They come up with an agent of their own. Well, because you were using a lot of verbs. You were saying it was preserved. It mutated. It was conserved. That's a lot of verbs. And they try to be tricky about it because they'll change some to passive verbs where it was this, it was that, this happened to it. Then there are also a lot of active verbs that they throw in there. It did this, it did that. And they're really personifying something, whether it's nature or that organism. They can't get away from the fact that there is an agent in there somewhere, whether they want to admit it or not. Exactly. Exactly. Um, phrased very well. They, they're, they're stuck with an agent. It looks like there's some kind of agent causation of those things. And you, you pointed out two, two things which our listeners should catch. There's two types of verbs that they use. They use the passive verbs. They use the active verbs. The passive verbs eventually become nothing more than magic words. And a magic word is skipping over a lot of missing data. Magic words, like what? It emerged. It evolved. It uh, burst onto the scene. Developed. It developed. So they use these words, and they they just toss them out. They don't tell you how it emerged. They don't tell you how it evolved, but the word itself becomes like a magical word. So it, you don't have to explain all the missing data with it. You just say it, it evolved or it emerged. Those are the passive verbs. And the active verbs are the ones that they ascribe to nature, where nature is personified to act like a substitute agent. And these have no scientific backing for them as well, where they will say, uh, and they're, they're obviously their agent is natural selection. Nature selects. So by merely uh, per- projecting onto nature the ability to select, they've projected onto nature volition and intelligence because only things with volition and intelligence can make a real bona fide selection. And once they personified nature like that, well, then nature can not only select, nature can act on, nature can favor, nature can work on, Nature can weed out. You can put all kinds of verbs, these active verbs, in there. And then that stops their scientific explanation. So on the passive verbs, it emerged, 
and they don't give you any more details of how it emerged. And when the active verbs of where they personify nature, they say, well, nature just favored this. End of explanation. They're, they do, they give you no more explanation of how it could have You can't define that more. You can't. You can't define how nature might have picked that. That's right. And then they cover it all in a big smoke screen of, um, of a period of time which is so large that none of us can fathom it. It's, it just boggles your mind a million years and tens of millions, hundreds of millions of years. Uh, no, none of us have any frame of reference to that. So it, it, it pretty much clouds the picture on all of this. And boom, it's taught as a fact. Well, and it's another magical word because it also just completely clouds the picture because a lot of these people who believe that the earth is billions of years old and teach, especially the ones who teach that the earth is billions of years old, it's almost like if you throw enough time at it, it'll solve anything. They can't explain how the mechanism actually works. And so they just say, well, time helps it along. Wow. But there's no way to replicate that experiment. No, you can't There's no it. empirical data to back that up. Exactly. And as the, it goes all back to the word that you said earlier, probability. They, they recognize the probability is very, very small. And so the probability of you and I winning the lottery by buying a lottery ticket is very, very low. You're probably wasting a lot of your money on by doing that. But if, you, if you're looking at millions of organisms at any one time, then you've actually bought a million lottery tickets. And if you get to buy a million lottery tickets every single day, year in, year out, then clearly one of these lottery tickets is going to win and you will then bury your very, very small probabilities with almost an unlimited number of chances mm -hmm. to get it. And I don't know if many of our viewers realize that the number of chances is to overcome these infinitesimally small probabilities. Well, and even realizing, even given that obscene number of chances, real organisms don't have that number of chances and they can only, they only have one chance. They would only have one generation to develop that. And even in, even in the amount of time that's given billions and billions of years on this planet, the odds even aren't big enough. People, some of our viewers even work out the numbers. Like what are the odds of this developing? And I don't know if they're right or not, but all of their numbers are massive. And even our geneticist, um, Dr. Tompkins has done some work with other areas, not specifically eyesight, but with other areas, just um, showing the probability of a certain thing happening genetically by chance, it's infinitesimal. It's tiny. You can't, right. you can't even put a number on it. For all practical purposes, from a <laughs> scientific standpoint, you would say it's impossible. And we're not, we're not saying impossible in the literal sense, but from a scientific standpoint, you hit a cutoff of the probability is so small. You say, well, this is just impossible to happen for those things. And yet, there's a key you said it's taught as fact. If these things are so incredibly unlikely, and if there is not proof to back it up, which there's not, why is this being taught as fact? It's being taught as fact because there's an agenda. There's, there's an agenda to the teaching of evolutionary thinking. And the agenda is really to explain why organisms look so incredibly designed. That's the agenda. That's the, that's the big question that's out there. You know, God did not come down and, hang, and fly a banner behind an airplane in this sense. Sometimes you know. wish he would, honestly. A, a lot of people wish he would uh, for those things. They, they kind of wish that, oh, they, why did, if he's really there, why doesn't he just come out and say, here I am and show yourself. I, I've heard people say something like that. A lot of our fo not our followers, but a lot of skeptics will see in the comments, why doesn't he just tell us he's there? And, and he has, but not in the way that they want him to with banner behind the airplane. Exactly. He has. The I itself is telling us he's here. He's here. You see that I, and as you mentioned, it, it's operating far better than even our best cameras today. You know, they're trying to track a football player down the field, and, and there's even some little plexing on, on those things because it's not working like ours is working. So you look at the eye. He's here. Where did that eye come from? You have to explain that eye. Not only do you have to explain that eye, you have to explain all the different types of eyes. So that's one um, thing to get around is, is they, 
is they come up with a pseudo designer, pseudo substitute engineer. They've come up with their their theory. It's made to explain to design in a way that nobody with a real brain would ever attribute it to God. You know, their their mechanism is something that no real engineer would ever use: random genetic mistakes, mutations. Have no you ever seen that. mistakes create something as efficient as the eye you described earlier? No. As an engineer, have you ever seen mistakes create such an efficient system? Never, never. And nobody nobody does it. And that's the point. No engineer would do it like that. And nobody would ever see us do it like that. So if nature was really doing it that way, then it probably wasn't engineered. That's why they say that. You know, Nobody would do it in such a clunky, uncoordinated, foolish way. But nature somehow, through a, a blind process, through random mistakes, totally random, which are sorted out by their non-random substitute agent natural selection, their interpretive framework for that, brought all this about. So any, any Christian who wants to claim that mechanism, the, the mutation selection mechanism, is playing right into their hands because it's built into the explanation that this is such a, an illogical, uncoordinated, non-purposeful mechanism that no thinking engineer would ever use it. And I would have to agree with that. Therefore, I would never attribute that mechanism of adaptation or change to the Lord Jesus Christ because when I do it, it's an insult. If someone attributed it to me as an engineer, I would consider it an insult. And to take it and attribute it to the Lord, it's, it's a genuine insult. He would never um, build something through that, that way. And, we don't and have a haphazard God. Not at all. We have a very careful God. Well, we just went through a lot of information, and now it is time to take a step back and just take a little break with our random science question of the day. So this one is tangentially related to what we're talking about, but why do you think God gave us the specific senses that he did? And we all know what they are, sight, hearing, touch, etc. Why do you think God gave us those senses? Well, whenever people ask me why, why did God... I'm always a little hesitant because <laughs> we can only guess. He doesn't right, tell us that, right? I can only guess, and and therefore to state authoritatively would be a little presumptuous. Okay, this is why God did that. Um, why did God he allow that? He told me that? yesterday. Yeah, he told me. <laughs> so without being uh, presumptu- presumptuous, um, it, it it it's another way that He reveals Himself and He enables us to learn about Him. Everything about it is self revelation. So as a parent. I have a better understanding of the love of the Father for me because I, I am a father and I love. And um, so I, said, I didn't say I know it exactly. I said I have a much better understanding of it and I have a much better understanding of sacrifice and giving. So he, he, he builds these things into the system so that we can know about him in ways that we probably couldn't just get by him just telling us, I love you very deeply. Okay, I believe it, but what does that really mean? But when he allows me to be a parent, oh, now I sense, I perceive better what he's done. So with senses, with senses, um, he, he's given us these senses, and it's not just the the ones that we've talked about. We actually have other senses, and, and creatures even have some incredible senses to detect things that we can't even detect at all ourselves there. He gave us these. So one, when he communicates with us, and he says, I, 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 I say this or I write this, we understand exactly what that is. And when he communicates, he tells us this. So it's all an avenue of collecting information about him. So why do we do it? Well, how would I know his genius unless I could detect it in some way through his creation? Therefore, he's given me these senses to detect. Not only has he given me those, he's given me a curiosity that I like to satisfy. So when, as a scientist or anybody, when you're researching something, you can almost become obsessed with it because it's very 
pleasurable. People don't think of it that way, but it is. And it's activating pleasure areas in your brain that are activated in other ways like that. So when, when children unwrap a Christmas present, you could, if you had electrodes on their brain, oh, these are, sensor, these are areas, or if you had a functional MRI or something like that, you could see places activating up. That there, there's something about unwrapping a present that is very exciting and it's pleasurable to do that. It's the same thing with scientific research. Every time you discover something, it's like, oh, I just opened another present. And then you look inside. Oh, there's more presents to open. I'll open those presents. You look inside, inside those presents, there's more. And so he, he does it to reveal himself to us, but it's also a gift. He allows us to discover, and discovery not only tells us about him, discovery is fun. Well, it is because even even just describing that, um, as we're recording this, it's a little before Christmas, and just picturing um, my family opening gifts on Christmas morning, we go through very methodically, and each person opens one gift at a time and all of that, and it's just this, oh my goodness, and even once you've opened the gift, it's joyous and it's exciting, but then once you put it aside, it was almost more fun before you knew what it was because you're discovering, and like you said, God puts these things out there for us to discover, to learn about him. And we were talking earlier about how sometimes some people wish that he would just put a banner behind an airplane or tell us everything just so that we could know all of the truth. He's told us what we need to know in his word and the rest he's put all over the place for us to have the joy to discover and to learn and to use our minds and to learn little nuggets about him in all these different areas. And like you said, that happened to you as a father, but also you've talked um, today and in the past about how as an engineer, you've been able to learn things about God's genius and about his beauty and all of those things because you can view it from an engineer's perspective and just all the pictures he puts in scripture. I, I know I'm getting distracted. I always get distracted with the random question of the day, but just all the pictures he puts throughout scripture, um, all the things he created to help us understand things about him. And I just, I love that. Thank you. That's a great answer. You're welcome. And he tied it right back to where we were talking about the eye because you mentioned the engineering and and engineering and biology go hand in hand. In fact, biology is in many ways a discipline of engineering. As you reverse engineer things and you study them, um, you can study things in, in nature, living things, and it can inspire you to build something as an engineer. Oh, maybe if I did it this way or I copied this, it would be good if we gave the Lord the credit for stuff when we plagiarize his ideas um, for those. But biology inspires us as engineers, but it goes the other way around. If I build something as an engineer and I know all of the steps it took and I know all the parts it took and I know all those things and I see something something functioning in nature similar to that, why why can't I just begin to study it from the same perspective? or this? Why can't I use my the knowledge of what I know as an engineer as the basis to launch into research into biology? Mm -hmm. And the answer is you can. So engineering can help inform biology at the beginning of research. One thing I wanted to ask you related to that, because we talked about the engineer that made all the different things that we see. One thing that is frequently brought up by people from an evolutionary perspective is one thing that you mentioned earlier about eyes and their similarity to each other. You mentioned a dragonfly's eye is very similar to a human's eye when it's in those beginning stages. And some people look at all those similarities across species and across even different types of species, um, whatever, I can't remember, like the genus, phylo, whatever. I don't remember that from high school science. But um, some people look at those and they say that that means that all of these evolved from a common ancestor. I did just want to touch on that um, how how would you address that with someone that mentioned that to you? Just saying that, oh, well, all of these are similar. They have the same purpose, the same function, or very, very similar functions because of a common ancestor. How would you approach that with them? I would say that's your interpretive framework. That's where you're going to be with your, with your mechanism is that you're going to claim a common ancestor. And, you know, the, I, I mentioned that it was the genetics that was very similar right at the very beginning, the same same genes are called Hox genes, which are very, very similar that set development down a particular path. But they're also very, very different. Uh, clearly, a dragonfly is radically different 
than a human eye, even though the basic function and even that chemical reaction that I was mentioning is very similar to each other. So you can come claim a common ancestor, but hopefully you can come up with a, tr a trace, a lineage somewhere where you're going to be able to draw uh, a connection, a, a dots all the way from this dragonfly eye back to a common ancestor and this other, and you can't. All you can do is fill in voids with massive amounts of imagination on those areas. Common design is a much better explanation as we see common designs. And in fact, um, the Hox gene that I mentioned, this Pax 6 gene, could be the smoking gun for common design. Because if I was an engineer and I drew out eyes for dragonflies and I drew them out for humans and I, and I would... Uh, I would put out a plan, a set of plans and specifications. I would put down in detail what I, how I want them each to function for their particular areas. But the basic goal of both was to collect information, to collect data and send it in. So I have an underlying basic purpose, a basic common function. And therefore, I would expect to find some element of similar information somewhere in my plans and specifications for that. And that's what Hox genes really are. It's an underlying basic level of information that was not predictable from evolutionary theory because they expected these things to have changed and radically mutated very differently over hundreds of millions of years. So much so that in the 1960s, Ernst Mayer said it was futile to even start looking for this common underlying information. This is before they could sequence DNA. Mm. So his prediction was it was futile to look for the similarities. Um, I, as a, as a creationist, said, well, no, I, I expect there to be some common design and some common underlying information. So we actually had predictions. In fact, I could show you uh, quotes by the founder of this ministry, Dr. Henry M. Morris, from the 1970s, where he was predicting, not just mentioning, predicting some type of similar information. Mm -hmm. So an evolutionist said, no similarity, his prediction. Evolution, creationist said, there should be some similarity. In the 1980s, when you would be able to sequence this DNA, you could actually put that to the test. And these genes, these Hox genes, the Pax 6 genes, is a much stronger confirmation for common design. And it was consistent with what we predicted. And if any of our readers or listeners call in, I can actually send them the quotes from those two gentlemen way back before you could even test them. And it just all goes back to remind us that we can trust what God says in his word. He made each creature after its kind. He tells us that in Genesis. And even back before they had some of the technology to look at this stuff for themselves, People who approach life and science from a biblical perspective, including Dr. Morris, were able to say, I'm going to say that the Bible's true and that this is what they're going to find. And he was right, not because of pure happenstance, but because the Bible is where we can learn reality. And all the other things just fall into place when you view the world through that framework. So that's just, this has been a really good reminder of just our amazing engineer. Um, did you have any closing remarks about the eye or about any of the engineering principles we've talked about or any encouragements to our, to our viewers and listeners before we wrap up? Well, I, I'll just piggyback on what you just said there. We can trust. We can trust what he says. And even if people could see things with their very eyes, doesn't mean that they will still trust. There's this element of belief. We, we know um, recorded throughout all of the scripture, that people did see things with their eyes. They saw miracles happen. They heard the voice of God say, this is my beloved son. They saw Lazarus raised from the dead. Uh, they were astounded. And even from that account, some believe and some rationalized. Mm -hmm. Belief versus rationalization. And that's exactly what we see today as scientists and researchers, we see just this, it's not just incredible complexity. We see the correspondence between man-made things doing a certain function and God-made things doing a similar function, corresponding systems, corresponding elements. We see that, and you're still going to get some who are like, wow, that is strong evidence of not just a, the reality of a creator, but the genius, wisdom, and power of the creator 
And you're still going to have some who will just rationalize it away. And we have the same responses to this day. I would encourage any of our listeners, don't go down the rationalization path. Follow what your intuition tells you, that these eyes are just phenomenal, uh, that it's ludicrous to believe random genetic mutations could ever bring about the genetic variability for this. Trust your intuition that this is pointing to an incredible, loving creator who loved us so much that he gave us life as our substitute to pay the penalty for our sins. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Galuza, for being with us today. Our conversations are always very encouraging and um, thought-provoking to me, and I'm sure our viewers and listeners feel the same. So thank you for being with us today. Oh, you're welcome. And to our viewers and listeners, um, don't forget to like and subscribe. You can find this podcast anywhere you normally find your podcasts, um, Spotify, YouTube, and more. We encourage you to subscribe so that you can be the first to find out about new content that we release. We release new episodes of this podcast every couple weeks, and we have other content as well. So we encourage you to subscribe. Thanks for being with us today, and we'll see you next time on The Creation Podcast. We want to say a huge thank you to our members and patrons. If you'd like to see your name here and unlock perks like early access to our podcasts, members only polls and live streams, behind the scenes footage or exclusive video content, links are in the description below.